We'll look at somebody around you and say, it's good to see you once again. Now look at somebody else on the other side of you and say, hello, neighbor. It's good to see you. Amen. Well, you guys can take your seats. It's good to be in the house of the Lord once again. Is it? They used to say when I was, um, when I grew up in church, they used to say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. <laughs> Anybody ever heard that? Remember that being said? <laughs> you know, you can always count on those repetitive, uh, I would say cliche statements, but they do get in you and, um, and there's truth in all of those things. As long as they came from the scriptures, of course. But, uh, but there were so many things that uh, growing up you hear, and they, um, then in certain moments, those things come up. They stir up in you. Well, today, we're going to be talking about our greatest love, our greatest love. And so I was listening uh, all throughout praise and worship today. Um, there, was, there seemed to be a common theme of pursuing God. And so uh, my message today is uh, along that line. Um, so we're going to talk about our greatest love. And there are some uh, things that we're going to get into by way of the word of God. And um, I believe that you are ready and you're listening as the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. So um, we're going to begin in Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. And this is Jesus quoting the Shema. You guys there? All right, we're going to read uh, verses 28 through 31. And it says in verse 28, and one of the scribes came, having heard and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel. That's natural Israel now, of course, and spiritual Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. That's everything that you have, okay? So when we're standing in here praising and worshiping, you know, that's everything that you have. You know, how many of you know that you don't have necessarily next Sunday to praise? You always have what? Right now. And he says, this is the first commandment. And then he says, the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And there is no other commandment greater than these. Now, um, Jesus records, or he quotes these, um, uh, these things that came from Old Testament scriptures, and these are prayers that um, the Israelites prayed and so forth. And um, there are two great commandments, and he says, you know, one, one uh, version of the gospel says, all of the law and the prophets hang on these. And so sometimes we put verse or the second one or the second commandment in front of the first one, you know, and that's how sometimes things go in the world and in the church is based on how we only treat people and then uh, we put God second. Okay, we've, we reverse the order. But the first order is this, is that God is what? He's first. It says, the first of all commandments is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with everything that is within you, your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, everything that you can physically muster up. He says, everything that you do in every area of your life, wherever it is that you work, wherever it is that you go to play, he says, whatever it is, make sure that you are honoring the Lord with all your, everything that you have in you. So when you go on your job, you should be 
honoring the Lord, right? When you're driving in your car, you should be doing what? When you're playing basketball with the fellas on the court, you should be doing what? When you're on the soccer field, you should be doing what? Okay. When you're at school, okay. When you're watching TV, when you are on your phone, okay, you guys aren't, don't, don't seem like you're willing participants this morning. All right. <laughs> all right. So in all areas, he says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with everything that you have in you, okay? That's the first commandment, okay? And the second, of course, is to love your neighbor. Look at the person beside you and say, I love you. All right, now, don't be giving them Google eyes and all of that, okay? All right, so look at somebody else around you and say, I love you. All right, so... These are two commandments that Jesus told us that we are to follow after. (laughs) And so now let's turn over to the book of Revelation. (laughs) The Bible tells us that we love him because he what? First loved us. So the, the whole reason that we even know what love is and how to love, okay, is because God has expressed his love towards us. And so we have many scriptures in the Bible that record and document um, the, the love of God that has been expressed to us. Um, the, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What more will he do for us now? All of these things that we see throughout the Bible time and time again were Uh, the Lord demonstrates his love towards us. Then over in Revelation chapter 2, you you know, Jesus now, uh, you know, back in Mark and in some other Gospels is recorded where he was quoting the Shema. Um, And now he's over in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and the Apostle John is recording him. And now he's beginning to reprimand the church. And as you look throughout these uh, chapters, um, these first couple of chapters in Revelation, he's talking about uh, the, the church age, and he's talking about the types of church that even exist today. And, um, and so he's reprimanding them. He's telling them about some things that they're doing well, and then he gets on them about some things that they're not doing as well. So um, verse 1, chapter 2, and all of this applies to us um, as we talk about loving God, as we talk about pursuing him, as we talk about honoring him and, and whatever it is that we do. Honoring God is not just when we come to church, of course. It's every day in our lives. It's every place where we go. It's every time throughout the day that we should be honoring him, that we should be pursuing him in different ways. And so it says in verse 1, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, says, he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou cannot bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say that they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And this is not every apostle, but there are some false apostles that are out there. Okay? And he says, And has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Okay? And so this is what we're talking about today, the pursuit of God's love and of his heart um, today. And this is what we're talking about. He says, nevertheless, I have something against you because you have left your first love. Even though you're doing some, some good things, there's some things where I can admonish you for. But there's something that is very critical, that, that is very crucial that I need to tell you about and that you need to correct. And he says, you have left your first love. And so Jesus is getting on them, and he's, and he's you know, telling them about um, how they have left their first love. This applies, of course, personally. Think about us in, as individuals, okay? Sometimes we get away from uh, some of the things of God that we were on fire about at one time. Um, it talks, he's talking to us corporately as a church. He's talking not just this ministry in this house. Of course, we are a part of that. But he's talking about the church as a whole. And then even uh, nationally, 
um, as a nation. I mean, if you can look around and you can see all of the stuff that is going on in our nation. Okay, God have mercy. And so he's talking about all areas. And of course, it began with us individually. It also took place in the church, but he's also talking about, and all of those areas, of course, affect the, the whole pot, the nation. And so, so all of these things are areas, and Jesus is saying, I, I, you know, this is something that needs to be corrected. I'm, I'm letting you know that you've gotten away from your first love. You've gotten over into some other things that has drawn your heart away from me. And so he's talking to the church. He's not talking to sinners. He's talking to the sons and the daughters of the Most High God. And so here are some of the reasons why sometimes we get away from our first love. Sometimes it's because of the hustle and the bustle of the everyday life. You guys know what I'm talking about, you know? We're so busy with um, everything else that is going on, everything else that we, uh, you know, that we cram into our schedules. Uh, one of the things that you guys, uh, some of you may know, some of you may not, as a part of the uh, vision statement here, Pastor Rock uh, mentioned, um, what's the word that begins with? Um, purpose, okay, to uh, re remove hectic schedules from your life, Okay. Focus, excuse me, yes, focus. Focus to remove hectic schedules from your life. Uh, because the enemy, one strategy of the enemy, this is a, a tactic of the adversary, is to keep you so busy doing other things. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's you're sinning by doing something that's, you know, sin necessarily. But what happens is because you you become so consumed with doing other things that at the end of the day, how many of you know that you only have a certain amount of strength? We just talked about uh, um, uh, loving the Lord your God with all your strength. But how many of you know that in this body, sometimes you got to rest? Sometimes you get tired, okay? Sometimes you get a little bit older, and sometimes your energy is not what it used to be, right? Okay, so you know what I'm saying? And so we have to be wise about our day in, day out schedules, okay, because um, sometimes the enemy uses the events in our daily lives to, um, if you have a purpose to put aside time for God in your early parts of your day, if you wait only until the end of the day, man, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Your Bible's going to be reading you, all right? You know what I'm saying. So, we have to focus to remove hectic schedules from our lives. And, and, and the enemy plays on these things in these days that we live in because everything is so fast paced and I gotta go do this and, and my boss is requiring me to do that and I got this job and I gotta go here and I gotta do that. I got this, this project that I have to take care of. I got all of these obligations, okay? What about Jesus? What about the Word of God? I have all these things I like to do, okay? What about the Word of God? And Jesus is saying, you're doing all these things, okay? But you've gotten away from your first love. How many of you know what muscle memory is? Okay? Muscle memory means that I can do something, especially if you're an athlete and you train or you do certain sports, you condition your body to respond in certain ways, or if you do, you undergo certain uh, training, okay, whether it's in the military or whether it's for police academy, whatever, you, you train yourself to develop certain uh, memory in your muscle that in an instance you respond a certain way. You train yourself. But some of us have spiritual muscle memory, and sometimes we go through the motions without the fire and the fervency being there of what we're actually doing. Sometimes we come to church um, out of the, the, just for the sake of coming to church with no fervency and no expectation that God is going to do something when I come to church on that Sunday. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? So sometimes we can do the right things, but our heart still not be in it. And this is what Jesus is talking about. He said, hey, you're doing a lot of good things. But when you look at the core and the root of the matter, and that's where Jesus is always looking at, He's not looking at all the fluff and all the, the, the buff on the outside. He's looking at the heart of the matter. And this is what he's always speaking to us. 
This is where he was speaking to them. He's looking at the heart and he's saying, yeah, you're doing a lot of good things and on the outside, it looks great. But he says, let me look a little bit closer. Let me reveal to you what I really see, okay? You've lost the fire and the fervency that you once had for me. When you were so passionate and you were so hungry for the things of God and now you begin to wane and you begin to wean yourself off of, off of those things. And this is what he's talking about here. And so he said, get back to your first love. Mark chapter four, uh, Jesus is talking in the uh, parable of the uh, sower in this instance. And in verses 18 and 19, he says, And these are they which are sown among thorns, as hear the word, and then the cares of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So at some point, you were on fire, but then the desires and the, and the, the ambitions for other things begin to enter in. And some of those things begin to take the place of God in your life in those areas. You know how it is for one time, you know, you, you were praying about something and you were, Lord, if you do this, I promise you, I will serve you. I will do this. I will let everybody know. And maybe you did at first. But again, at some point you begin to waver. And this is what Jesus is talking about here. He says, there are things that sometimes enter in whether it's things that, you know, are self-ambitions, and sometimes we, there are selfish ambitions, but sometimes there are things that enter in as we are pursuing. You know, you know there was a movie that came out years ago called The Pursuit of Happiness, you know, which is, you know, really about the pursuit of, I guess, the American dream and, and you know, making my place in the world and all of that, okay? Well, God never said to pursue happiness. He said to pursue him. And, and as he says in Matthew 6, as I seek first, okay, again, everything that we see is God wants to be first in our lives. The first four commandments were about honoring God and putting him first. And then the other six were about dealing with, you know, man, our relationship with man. But God has to be first in every area. And then when we keep him first, then that, that job that he blessed you with, he's going to make sure you're first in that job. That, 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 that spouse that he blessed you with, he's going to make sure that, you know, things are going well with you and your relationship. But it's when we begin to get the order out of place, that's when we begin to give place to the devil, and that's when other things begin to come in. And so Jesus said there are other things, other appetites and desires that come in, and then because we get to a place or where we get comfortable or some of the things that we've been believing God for, they begin to take place in our lives. Then we begin to lose sight of the one that, that made those things happen. Okay. And Jesus said, you've gotten away from your first love. Sometimes it's offense towards God or towards other people that cause us to get away from our first love. And, and there are people that get mad at God because something happened in their life and they blame God for. Or they didn't understand why this happened or whatever the case is and they blame God. Or sometimes people get offended with other people. And these things cause people's hearts to be drawn away from, from God, away from Jesus. And other things, again, begin to enter in. And so these are the things that God is warning us about. He's warning us about, this is Jesus. He was talking to us, the church, and he's still speaking to us. And I know that he's speaking to your hearts right now about some things. And so he goes on to say in the next verse, uh, he says, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. This reminds me of what he says over in Isaiah about Lucifer. Where, where have you fallen? O thou who has fallen. And, and he says, remember, therefore, when you are fallen and repent and do the first works, do the first things where you were pursuing after me, man. And it didn't matter what time of the morning it was. It didn't matter how tired you was. It didn't matter who you were around. He says, go back to do the first things where you didn't you didn't regard some of the things that you now uh, dismiss. He says, where have you uh, from whence have you fallen? 
So there is a place where of, uh, uh, what he, in other words, what he's saying is you were in a spiritual place where you were with me and now you've, you've reduced yourself or you've gone to a lower place of where maybe now you're just doing things through the motions because you know what the word of God says now and you've done some things and you've had some experiences with God and in the church and so forth and all of that. But now you're just doing things out of habit and not out of the sincerity and out of the, 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 the ferocity that, that you once did those things in. And this is what he's talking about here. And so now you're doing things out of just mental uh, ascent or spiritual uh, muscle memory. And he says, repent and do the first work so else I will come to thee quickly and remove your candlestick out of its place except you repent. So the highest place for us to be seated is in Christ Jesus, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And the greatest place for our heart to be is at the feet of Jesus. And so this is what we're talking about here today. There are areas where there, there are indicators and, and there are visible things that go on in our lives where we see that we have uh, gotten away from our first love. The fervency and the priority of the things of God um, have diminished in our lives and we become casual as a Christian, routine oriented. Okay, the first area is in our prayer life. And this is sometimes one of the first areas that begins to suffer. The Bible tells us that men ought to always pray and not lose heart, to not faint. There is a strength that comes from our time of prayer. There is a, a deepening in our relationship with the Lord that comes through prayer. There is discernment that comes through prayer, especially prayer in the Spirit, prayer in the, praying in the Holy Ghost. There is a, a spiritual discernment that comes when we are doing that. And when we get away from that, we get away from that, that fire, we get away from that relationship that we, you know, that, that personal time that we have with the Lord. When we begin to lose our communication with the Lord, that's what happens when we begin to not pray as much. Or we, we'll pray quick prayers or we'll, you know, we say, you know, things that are just uh, repetitious things that we repeat over and over again. And, I, and I'm not talking about, you know, uh, uh, declarations and decrees and stuff. I'm just talking about when we pray, we say the same old thing. See, when we pray, in order for it to mean something to God, it has to mean something to us. The Bible says the effectual, heartfelt prayer of a righteous man avails much. So there has to be some fire in your prayer when you go before God in order for God to say, okay, you serious about this thing now. And so he says, when we pray that we, well, that we should ought to pray, that we always ought to pray and not lose heart. So when we begin to lose heart, that's, that's one indicator that there's a prayerlessness that's going on in our lives. Another area that we see is in our worship. Our worship is very dry. I'll say that again, our worship is very dry. And so when we come into church, you know, we, we gotta, it's like we, those old record players where you gotta sit there and wind it up. You, you ever seen those old school ones where you gotta wind it up and that's what sometimes has to be done during praise and worship. And by the time we get to the fifth song, then you're ready. So, you know, your, your praise and your worship, those things begin to diminish when you begin to um, uh, lose your first love. But every day there should be some form of prayer that goes on in our lives, morning, noon, and night, okay? Praying not just for our own needs to be met, you know, Lord, bless my four no more, but there should be prayer that goes on for the church, for everything that God wants to do in this time and in this generation, what he wants to do through our ministry, everything that, that God wants to do to touch those that are around you on your job. Instead of talking about and complaining about them, offer up prayer to them, to God about them. You know, all of the things that we should be praying about. Then there's our worship where we should be on fire to, towards God and thanking him for everything that he does in our lives every day, thank him for the little things, and then that'll lead to him, him th us thanking him for the big things, that'll lead to us seeing more things that we need to be thankful for and that we need to be grateful for. 
our worship. Then there comes to our time with the Bible, okay? Many people do not read their Bibles and they just sit in church and wait for the pastor or the preacher or whoever, and many people don't read their Bibles. And so this is how many people get deceived because they have no idea what is in their word. So all of these things, they, be, they become signs and indicators. And I'm saying this to you because you know what's going on in your life personally. You know if you're not praying. You know if you're not worshiping. You know if you're not spending time in your word. All of these are things that Jesus was warning. He says, you've gotten away from your first love because if you're not praying, if you're not worshiping, if you're not spending time in your word, then who is? You're the church. Who's going to get the, the lost one? Who's going to be sensitive to the things where I'm leading you to if you're not even in tune to the basic things? The, 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 the things that we should have as a habit and a continuous thing in our lives every day. And so he's talking to the church because we are in time church. And this is what you have to understand. We are in time saints, not ain'ts. And so if you are going to, uh, if God, if you're going to be a part of the next move of God, if you're going to be a part of, of changing the world that is around you, then you're going to have to make sure you have connected with your first love. Amen. And so another thing that we see is in church attendance. It, it, see, we're talking about things that when you get away from your first love, there are things that aren't priority in your life anymore. These are telltale signs. Church isn't as important. When you first got born again, man, you were eating up everything you could. And now, as you know, I, I got to work the next day, you know, so, you know, I'm just going to, you know. Or, you know, that, let your boss say, I need you to work extra or later or come in or whatever the case is. What I'm trying to tell you is this. If we have no fervency, if we have no urgency, see, we are too casual because we, we get too complacent. And Jesus was reprimanding them. He says, you've gotten away from your first love. You put all of these things and now you're making excuses because that's what happens. We begin to make excuses as to why we don't do the things that we should. And the Bible says this, he that knows to do good and does not do it to him is, it is what? It is sin. Um, taking the time to evangelize when we're around others. Sometimes we're so busy to get in the store and get out or to you know, go on to the next thing on my schedule that we don't even take the time sometimes to um, encourage somebody or to speak a word, ask them about their life, about their salvation, you know? And so if you ever around Apostle Ella, I mean, we were just in the Verizon store the other day, man, and she's gonna make sure that it ain't gonna be the whole conversation, but it's gonna be a part of the conversation, you know? Um, do you go to church? Where do you go to church? Why don't you go to church? Okay, I was just sitting there be laughing it to myself because I, I was just sitting there like, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, when, you know, a part of everything that we do and that we should be as, as Christians, a part of that is the Great Commission. And the Great Commission, you don't, you don't have to wait until you go across the, the, the pond to Africa before you, miss, you do mission work before you witness to somebody. It doesn't have to be some, you know, really, you know, dramatic experience. It's just, you know, talking to your neighbor about God, talking to those that you come into contact with, that you do business with, those that you can touch, as they say in multi-level marketing, the three-foot rule, you know? And so we, we as a I'm, and when I say the church, I'm not just talking about us in this house. I'm talking about the church as a whole. Uh, we've gotten a different mission statement when it comes to the things of God. Let's look at some things here about what it means to pursue after God's heart. Um, let's look at David for a little bit. I'm going to skip through some things here. 
Let's look at David. The Bible says this about David, that he was a man after God's own heart. Acts chapter uh, 13. You can turn there. You can read it. Acts chapter 13. Um, let's look at verse 22. There are three, thing, three things that I want to talk about with David that he shows us about the attitude of heart that we should have. In Acts chapter 13, verse 22, this is what God said about David. It says, And when he had removed him, talking about uh, King Saul, when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. David has such an integrity of heart towards things that matter to God. And this is what we're talking about. And this is what Jesus was referring to here in uh, Revelation chapter 2. This is what he was quoting in the Shema about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. There is an integrity of heart that we should have when it comes to the things of God and the things that matter to God himself. And sometimes that is missing in the church. We come to church for a lot of different reasons, you know, to get my needs met, to get a husband, to get a wife, to get a business deal, whatever the case is, to hear the word of God, okay, um, you know, to fellowship with others. We do you know, a lot of reasons. A lot of them are good. Some of them are very selfish sometimes. But Jesus is telling us that we need to make sure that in everything that we do, everything that we do, that our heart attitude should be that, that I am pursuing after, pursuing after the Lord and to, uh, to connect my heart with his heart. Lord, what matters to you? What is it that you are trying to do right now? What is it that you want me to do? See, I may have things that I plan in my schedule and in my day, but Lord, where is it that I can go? Who is it that I can talk to? Who is it that I can reach? What is it that you want me to do? What do you want me to pray about? Do we ever give our ear and our time to allow the Lord to speak to us in such a way? So David had a heart that what mattered to God mattered to him. And this is why the Lord said, he, he's a man after my own heart, and this is what happens when you are after God's heart. It says at the latter portion of verse 22, which shall fulfill all my will. Because what matters to God matters to me. And so I'm going to make sure that even when it doesn't seem good, doesn't feel good, and I may not even want to, because what matters to God matters the most, I'm going to do it and I'm going to make sure it gets done. If you've not learned anything here in this ministry, you've learned this, okay? That faith <laughs> does not mean that it's always going to be easy, but it does mean that it's possible. And this is what David understood. He says, I'm, what matters to God matters to me. And everything about when you look throughout David's life, now he made some mistakes, <laughs> But there were things that were indicated that we see from his life where there was a certain integrity of heart that he had towards the things of God that I'm going to make sure. If nobody else is doing it, I'm going to make sure that it's getting done. We have the example when it comes to the account of David and Goliath. He, we see how he defended the honor of God in that situation and in that instance. One of his heart's attitude was that I defend the honor of God. He comes along bringing some cheeses to his brothers. 
they had heard Goliath get up for 40 days, blaspheme in the name of the Lord. David comes along, and, and notice how it, 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 the, the writer <laughs> puts it. It says, and David heard him. It's like, uh-oh, something's about to go down. All right? Whenever you see something specifically mentioned like that, you know that something is about to change. Something different is about to happen. What Everybody else heard it, and they like, man, David heard it and said, what? You did what? He said, what? David defended. He had a hard attitude to defend the honor of God. That's what God is looking for in the days that you and I live in. He was not ashamed of God. He was not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He didn't say, well, I know that the Bible says this, but, you know, uh, we, we live in these modern times, and um, that's okay. You know, that was for back then. No, David, if he was living in this time, he, said, he, would, he would say straight up, no. Who, who do you think you are? You're talking about the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Who do you think you're talking about? David was, Peter had a little David in him, you know. He was going to pull out the sword and he was going to go to business. You know, so this is, the, this is the, the, the hard attitude that David had to defend the honor of God. And when we defend the honor of God, guess what? How many of you had a situation where somebody, you know, verbally or personally attacked you? Yes. Yes, okay. I think everybody at some point in your life can say that. You know, now, when we defend the honor of God, this is what God also does. And it's not necessarily because we defend his honor, but because we pursue him. And even in those instances, when somebody comes at us and personally attacks us or they put their mouth on us or whatever, you don't even have to defend yourself because you know who defends you? The Lord does. Now, I'm not saying you don't say, oh, I need to loose myself from all word curses and negative words. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against me, judgment I condemn, and all of those things. But God is the one that defends you. He's the one that, that has your back. He is the, the, the jealous husbandman, okay, as we are the bride of Christ, and he's the one that will defend your honor then, okay? Something I learned. I had some uh, situations, and some of you heard me say this years ago on a job where um, I used to do electrical work, and this guy used to run his mouth on, after me on the job. He used to tease me or whatever because of my Christian standards and so forth. Um, you know, I didn't have sex before marriage. He knew all of that, and so, you know, guys talk a whole bunch of stuff on the jobs. So you guys, any guys ever been on a part of that? You've heard some stuff that men say. And so uh, this guy used to run his mouth or whatever all of the time and stuff. And I mean, he used to he used to let me have it, and in front of other people, you know, he you know how it is on a job and, and with guys, uh, the, around the fellas, you know. And so um, something happened on the job where this guy was horse playing around on the job, and caused another uh, coworker to get injured. And the guy had to end up going to the hospital. Was in the hospital for several days and so forth. And this guy was scared because he thought he was going to lose his job. All of these other things that was going on, he thought it, his career was over with. So uh, ended up, first person, that day it happened, first person, you know who he comes to? Comes to me for prayer. <laughs> I ain't even heard that he prayed at all or, or, or anything about God. He comes to me for prayer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know how you are in those moments, you're thinking this and this in your head. <laughs> Serves you right, you should have known. <laughs> so, but... <clears throat> So I prayed with him, you know. I prayed with him. I, I, I prayed with him. I, you know, I, I didn't hold any grudges and stuff like that. Prayed with him, and then um, as it turns out, the guy came out of the hospital, you know, after a few days. He was fine, and um, he didn't lose his job. Everything was, everything was well. And so um, after that, man, no more. No more issues with him. I mean, that guy was my best friend for the, the rest of the time I was there, you know. And so... Uh, so there's so many other instances where God will fight for you, okay? But we also must defend his honor, okay? We must stand for truth in these days. 
because there's a lot of compromise. There's a lot of watering down of the word that goes on. There's a lot of, of wishy-washiness that goes on even in the church. And because it goes on in the church and there's no standard like it should be in the church sometimes, then there's no standard in the world and there's nothing that is gonna cause the sinner to repent because he says that I can do whatever I wanna do because you're doing whatever you wanna do. So there has to be a standard where we defend God's honor, his truth in the times that we are living in. Okay, you guys with me? Okay, another thing that we saw David do is that um, in 2 Samuel chapter uh, 6, let's turn over to that. 2 Samuel chapter 6. It did not matter how high up David got. He danced before the Lord. He did not possess anything that was too good for him to praise the Lord. He did not, because he had arrived at a certain uh, social status, he did not allow that to cause him or to prevent him from uh, praising the Lord um, <laughs> in a very, uh, according to his wife, obnoxious manner. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6. Uh, let's go down to uh, verse uh, 14. Now the, uh, the ark of the Lord was being brought to the city of David. And we pick up in verse 14. There's some other things that had happened before that. And now we're, we're going to pick up in verse 14 for the sake of time. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. Remember what the Shema says? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your, all your strength, you know? Now, I, I, I have not seen anybody in here do that yet in church, okay? You know, we have our own personal limits as to how far we'll go with praise and worship, do we not? Okay, yes, you may as well say yes. Now, sometimes we reserve a little bit more, we cut it loose a little bit more at home, right? Um, but David, he's, he danced before the Lord. Here is the king. You got to understand this. This is not the shepherd boy, David. All right? This is not the one that was, you know, had just killed Goliath. This was David the king. The king, okay? This is David the king. It says, David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David girded with a linen ephod and so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of, of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he dealt among them, uh, among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well as to the women, as men, um, to everyone, a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. And so all the people departed, everyone to his house. And David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, with sarcasm, how glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself. In other words, he took off his kingly garments, okay? You're the king. You're the highest status position in all the land. And yet you lowered yourself, okay? This is what she's saying. Now she's saying this in a snarling sarcastic, you know, voice here, okay? You know, um, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. And David said unto Michael, <laughs> woman, <laughs> it was before the Lord. It was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I play before the Lord 
uh, therefore will I play before the Lord, and I will yet be more vile than this. You ain't seen nothing yet. If you think this is upsetting you, sweetheart, <laughs> keep on watching. So no matter what happened, what status David got to, he knew what God had done for him. He said, I will never lose sight of my first love and what God has done for me, who he is in my life, and where he has brought me from. This is what he's saying here. I'm not just because I get a little change in my wallet that I'm going to look down on somebody else. Or just because I get to a certain social status, I'm going to look down on somebody. Or because I got so many thousands of followers on my social media account. I'm reaching more people than pastor. <laughs> See, we get away from our first love. David was a man after God's own heart. What mattered to God mattered to David. And this is what God is looking for. This is what Jesus is saying to us today. Does what matters to me matter to you the most? Or is it just your own ambitions? Is it just what you want to do in life? Let's look at one more thing about David. The last thing we're going to look at is how concerned he was about the house of God or the lack thereof at this particular juncture in time. Let's turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 7. One more chapter over. It says this, and it came to pass, verse 1, when the king sat in his house and the Lord had given him sound, or had given him rest round about from all his enemies. Okay? So we see here David has gotten to a place of rest in the Lord. He's gotten to a place where you know, his prayers have been answered. He's gotten to a certain place of status in life. He's been the king. You know, God has taken care of all of his enemies. You know, how many of you would like all of your enemies to be taken care of? Okay. There's, there's a, a debt. <laughs> there is, you know, the stuff that comes against your bodies. There's the stuff that comes against your minds, the stuff that goes on in your families, or stuff that goes on in the world around. How many of you would like all your enemies to have been taken care of? David got to a place, okay, where, you, you know, you might say you could just coast along right now. It says that David, it came to pass that when the king sat in his house, the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan, the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within curtains. Do you see the attitude of his heart that is going on here? See, what matters to God mattered to him. Even at a place where, you know, he had everything going on for him. Sometimes if we get everything, you know, we get satisfied in certain areas or certain points or places, then we sometimes lose the fervency for God and the things that, uh, that matter to God. We stop coming to church as much or we stop reading the Bible as much, stop praying as much, all of those things. And then problems come back up and then it was like, oh Lord, again. You know what I'm saying? Help me. <laughs> but David said, the king said unto Nathan, see now that I dwell in the house of cedar. I mean, God has blessed me the Lord has prospered me. He's given me all these things. He's done all of this for me. But the ark of God dwells in curtains. And Nathan said to the king, go and do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. So we see here that David, heart, David's heart was still towards God. He was still concerned about everything that mattered to God. He didn't want his house to be all well and established and then the, 
the, the, the place where God, where the, the presence of God resided was in some little, uh, little tent behind some curtains. He says, if my house looks like this, then where the house or the, the place where God is should be much, much better than my, my own house even. This is the attitude that he had. And this is the attitude that we should have. You know, when, when, when you've gotten the results that you've needed in your life in a particular area, whether it's that new position on your job, okay, whether it's that promotion that you were believing God for, or, or it's when you got that, that spouse, that husband or that wife that you had been believing God for, when you've gotten those things, will you take your foot off the gas pedal, okay? When, when you've gotten that new car that you've been believing God for, will that new car keep you from coming to church? Or will you drive it to church, you know? When, when it's, you know, not your time to, to, to lead a prayer service or to, to, to lead in your position in the church, will you step off the gas pedal just because you're not in that position anymore? Or will you stay with your first love and you will keep your foot on the gas pedal? See, as we move forward in the, um, in the next move of God, see, as we pursue him, there are more and more graces that God releases into, into the church that enables us to do things that, are, that go beyond our intellect, that go beyond our financial ability, that go beyond uh, uh, the, the, the natural limitations that other people will be struggling with. The Bible says this um, in, over in um, uh, 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 30. It says, and the remnant, okay, and I believe that our church, our ministry, and those of you out there that are hungering and seeking after God, you're part of the remnant. It says, and the remnant that is escaped out of the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. And I believe that God is talking to us. See, we can never move into the next things of the Spirit of God in the shallow, if our roots are shallow, just along the surface. You ever seen a tree that has shallow roots? And, and, the, and the shallow roots, they will tear up the grass. When a storm comes, when, you know, when turbulence comes, they are easily blown over and uprooted. But the Bible says the righteous are like a, a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that bring forth fruit in this season. So there is a source that is below the surface, beyond what we see, that we can tap into, that is beyond what is visible. We don't have to rely on just the, the visible things in our environment to be nourished and to be fed and to be watered. There's a deeper place. Look at the person beside you and say, dig deeper. <laughs> There is a deeper place where our roots can go. And the Bible says that when our roots are deep, there's some spiritual depth, then there is fruit that we will bear. And so as we move forward in the next things of the Spirit of God in this ministry and in this house, you know, ask yourself these questions. Does the Lord have my heart or does other things? Can the Lord count on me to do those things and to have the integrity of heart to make sure that what God wants done will be done? I'm sure along the way that David made many sacrifices. Even along the way here, as I've been around uh, this house from the onset, I've seen many sacrifices that have been made by the apostles, by our, our family, by some of you, some of you have made sacrifices because you valued what God values. And this is what God is looking for, and this is what it's going to take in these days. When you are standing up for the things that matter to God, and you are making sure that God is first, I promise you, I promise you, you will not lack for anything in your life. I've done things to you know, at times, you know, in times past to uh, when, you know, 
things weren't as great, you know, financially, even in the, you know, here in the ministry here. And, and I did things out of, um, you know, because I could do it and not because the Lord told me to do it. And this is where, again, your prayer, you, you know, I'll say this and I, was, I, I referred to this earlier, how important your prayer life is because there are things in that will God, that God will direct you in and he will give you checks in your spirit or he'll, you'll have those nudges in your spirit where you know that you shouldn't do it. And then sometimes the Lord will tell you, you know, as I've heard the Lord ask me before, say, what are you doing? Okay? And then it's up to you as to what you do. But in these days, you got to have, you know, you have to have prayer for better discernment. And when I didn't listen, guess what? I ended up fracturing my foot and almost getting my index finger cut off. Because I, the Lord asked me, said, what are you doing? And I still did it. So this is what I'm telling you in these days. There has to be more spiritual depth. We have to be more in tune to, uh, with our spiritual senses as to what God is saying. And it's not about, you know, what I need to do and what I want to do. But Lord, what is it that you need to do? And what is it that you want me to do? And when I do that, then God will bring my way everything else that I have been needing of, in need of, but because I have kept him first and I have not forsaken my first love, then all of the other things will come. And this is what we've seen. This is when God causes you to flourish when it doesn't seem like there is prosperity in the land because your roots are connected to another source. Amen. So let's stand. Let's lift our hands unto the Lord right now. Let's say these words. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for loving me. I ask you to show me any areas in my heart where I've gotten away from you as my first love. I know that even as the word was going forth today, that you were showing me areas that I need to get back to you in. But my heart is still open to show you, to, to have you show me, excuse me, any other areas where I have gotten away from you as my first love. I ask you to forgive me. I repent for putting anything before you and to allowing anything else to be on the throne of my heart with all of my heart I will pursue you I will give chase to you I will seek after you and draw near to you as you said in your word when I draw near to you you will draw near to me so I thank you for forgiving me I thank you for pursuing me as I pursue you and revealing yourself more and more and more to me. I bless you and I thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So as we move forward in this day, allow the Lord to develop more sensitivity to the Holy Spirit in your life. Some of the things that you've heard today, allow the Lord to continue to speak those things to your heart and 
Allow him to continuously change your life that you may walk in God's best. The church as a whole needs it. Our nation as a whole needs it. It is because you and I are here and because of what we stand for that God's mercy is continuously extended. It's because of your prayers that your family members and your friends that you've been praying for and some that you submitted up here in the, in the bucket that is up here, that God continues to work on them and work in through them and work towards them that they may be saved. What about the church? What about our nation? What about the nations of the earth? We want to see God work in our generation, just as he worked in generations of old. There has to be a relentless pursuit and hunger for what matters to God. And that's the only way That's the only way. Those of you that have been out there watching us today, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being a part of the 40 nations around the world that watch this uh, the word that goes forth from this house. We pray that as you've listened to us today, that you've heard the Lord speaking to you wherever it is that you are. And may the Lord continue to uh, chase after you as you pursue him for he loves you and he wants to reveal himself to you and, and right where you are in a greater way so if as the word has continued to be a blessing to you from this house and you've enjoyed the time that you witness here please share that with someone else let us know um, uh, that you've been encouraged by the word Go to our website, fccwoc.org, and let us know how the word is blessing you. Well, it's, a, it's a tremendous blessing to hear from you how uh, the testimonies that God has done and worked in your life. You heard Apostle Rock earlier say about someone that was healed of prostate cancer, someone recently that was uh, delivered from uh, alcoholism that had been bound by that spirit for nine years. There are things that God will do in you, for you, to you, and through you, if you allow. So God bless you. We look forward to seeing you next time and hearing uh, and being able to share God's word with you. On behalf of our apostles, Chastine and Ella Rock, I'm Pastor Milton. God bless you. Have a great week.